Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we have 25 questions here for the Q&A, all submitted by some of the fine folks over on Patreon, whose direct support makes this channel possible. Big thanks to all of you guys, and let's dig into the questions. First off, we have a question from Spanky's Basement. Uh, this person asks, do you think the delayed roller lock could become rele a relevant system again? For example, if a company were to incorporate it into a modern style of rifle. Yes, actually, um, the more I look at the different delay blowback systems, the more relevant they certainly seem to have the potential to be. Uh, the two that are out there that were adopted in large scale by militaries are the, uh, the roller delayed, like in the Heckler & Koch G3, and lever delayed, used in the FAMAS, which we'll be talking about a little bit later in this session. Uh, the advantages of the delayed blowback systems are really all based around their simplicity. With, if you don't use delayed blowback, you pretty much have to use either a recoil operated system or a gas operated system. Recoil is generally problematic because it requires the whole barrel to move, which has implications for accuracy, and also has the potential to introduce a lot of friction into the gun and be a reliability issue. Uh, Gas operated systems are better, but you still have a lot of moving parts in a gas operated system. You have to have a gas block, you have to have a gas port drilled in the barrel, you have to have some sort of piston actuator to do something with that gas. What's really intriguing about the delayed blowback systems is you can just like wipe all of those parts off of the gun. You don't need any of them. And the G3 is a perfect example of this. It's a relatively accurate gun because it has a fixed barrel, there's no gas piston. Um, it's just really remarkably simple and durable. Those things just kind of go on working forever. Now the downside to the delayed blowback systems is that they tend to be a little bit more sensitive to ammunition uh, specifications than other guns because they are built around um, a careful mathematical model of the amount of force acting rearward on the bolt face. So it's harder to tinker with bullet weights and velocities. Um, now that, that's generally not a problem for a military force, but the other way that that can be an issue is with varying quality of ammunition. And you see that during wartime. World War I was a fantastic example. One of the main problems with the Ross rifle wasn't so much a problem with the rifle, it was that it required a very close, closely toleranced uh, ammunition. And British ammunition production during World War II fell dramatically in quality. And the crappy ammo they were producing didn't really fit in a lot of the Ross rifles, which was a problem. If you have that happen with, say, a G3 in the middle of a large war, if ammunition quality goes down and the, uh, you, know, you have a lot more variability in powder charge, that could potentially cause problems for a delayed blowback rifle. So everything in small arms design is a compromise, it's a give and take, and with that in mind, I think there is definitely room for delayed blowback systems to have, uh, to have purpose in modern rifles. Next question is from Jonathan, it says, what exactly are the differences between a gas tappet system and a short stroke gas piston system? What are the pros and cons of each? It's pretty much a matter of, uh, of uh, magnitude. So a short stroke gas piston means that you have a gas piston that is pushing on the bolt carrier and it's going to travel, the piston itself is going to travel less than the length of the cartridge. So the classic example of this is the Tokarev, which became the AR-18. You'll see this in a huge swath of modern 5.56 caliber rifles, uh, the G36, the, uh, what were the, the L85 is like that, the AR-18, all of these things, and they, these all the way, these by the way, all come from the Soviet Tokarev. Uh, you'll also find that system in the G43. The advantage of that system is while it requires more movement and larger parts and more weight, it also is easily disassemblable for cleaning. So if the gas piston starts to get clogged with fouling, you can take it apart in the field, easily clean it up and be back in action. A gas tappet system is the same sort of idea in that your gas piston moves a short distance back and then stops and then the bolt carrier has to travel the rest of the way on its own. That's the difference, by the way, between short stroke and long stroke. The, with a gas tappet though, you're talking just a couple millimeters of movement of the gas piston, so to speak. And it basically just 
gives a, a whack to the bolt carrier, and then inertia does all the rest. The advantage of that is it's a much smaller, lower profile set of parts. You don't need a gas piston reaching as far back. You don't need it to move as far. You have less bearing surface involved. The downside is gas tappet systems are generally not field disassemblable. They're not very likely to clog up, but if they do, you don't have a good way to, to fix that, to clean it, short of really detail stripping the gun. So um, most, most militaries have gone with, have ended up going with short stroke pistons. There aren't a whole lot of gas tappet systems out there. And I think that's probably because the downsides of the short stroke piston just really aren't that big of a deal. And it's nice to be able to take the thing apart and clean it. Next up from Nemo, what procedure do you have to clean firearms typically? Uh, in particular, older firearms that you might shoot with corrosive ammo and have to take extra care to preserve. I live in Florida where humidity is a constant enemy. Well, there's going to be a substantial difference in what you need to do in Florida versus here in Arizona. Uh, we have very low humidity pretty much year round. And so honestly, not much is required to properly, effectively maintain firearms. Um, if I were in a, a higher humidity place, I would definitely make sure to keep a coat of oil, at least a thin coat of oil on all the metal parts of, of a firearm. Uh, and you'll see that, by the way, at some of the, uh, specifically at the Institute of Military Technology, when I film videos there, they're in Florida and they tend to keep their guns heavily oiled. And people have pointed that out in videos, like, holy crap, that thing's like dripping oil. Well, yeah, because they don't want to take any chances with something uh, getting rusty when they're not paying attention. So uh, when it comes to corrosive ammo, the two things that I find as a solution for uh, cleaning corrosive primer salts out of a rifle are plain water, best if it's heated, and ballastol. Uh, ballastol is really an excellent and underappreciated cleaning solution. Uh, you mix up some of that with water and it takes care of pretty much anything. Um, it'll deal with corrosive smokeless powder, it'll deal with black powder, it's non-toxic, it's really an excellent product, and that's, that's my go-to. So, uh, let's see, Jeffrey says, could you do a brief synopsis on post-World War II Yugoslavian Mausers? The M2447, the M48, the M48A, the M9848, etc. It seems they're a fairly overlooked set of rifles, and I can't seem to find a lot of information on them compared to other variants. Yeah, the Yugoslav guns have never really attracted much interest in the collector market. I think largely because, just because Yugoslavia, a lot of people associate that with less than stellar quality. However, Yugoslav Mausers are excellent guns. Uh, the original, the first batch of them, the M24s, were manufactured, the first batch actually manufactured by FN in Belgium and purchased by uh, Yugoslavia. And they also purchased the production license to make the guns. So. Uh, I think it was in 1927 they actually managed to get production up and running, and they manufactured a large number of M24 pattern Mauser rifles before World War II. Some, I think a million of them, or maybe more. After World War II, they came back and they retrofitted a lot of those guns, refurbished them, and I believe what they actually did was slightly change a few of the configuration bits, you know, where the sling swivels were, the exact stock and handguard configurations, and that's what became the M2447. And I suspect I have at least one of those little details wrong, and someone's going to point it out in the comments. But we'll, we'll move on for a moment. Um, so the 2447s are Model 24s that were refurbished right after World War II. After the war, they also started up production again of new Mausers. But they were new Mausers in a slightly different pattern. That was the M48. It started off with pretty much all nicely milled parts. And they slowly started adding some stamped parts in as replacements. Things like uh, barrel bands, uh, magazine floor plates, that's an easy one to spot. And so those were the M48A with some stamped parts and the M48B with a few more stamped parts. That's the basic rundown of Serbian Mausers. You've got the pre-war ones that were then refurbished, and then you've got a couple uh, iterations of post-war manufactured guns. I was going to suggest that you pick up a copy of the North Cape Publications book on Serbian Mausers by Branko, I can't quite remember his last name, it starts with a B. Um, and I went to take a look and noticed that it's apparently has, they've, it's gone out of print. It was published in something like 2005, but they have run out of the ones that they printed and they haven't done a second run. 
and prices on that book are insane. They're like 150 bucks or more pretty much everywhere. So if you can find a copy of that book, definitely grab it if you're interested in the subject. It's not the greatest book ever written. There are some mistakes in it. But when you go and try to find any information elsewhere on Serbian Mausers, you very quickly realize that there's almost nothing written. And that North Cape Publications book is by far the best resource out there. So um, if you're seriously interested, find yourself a copy of that book. See if you can hit one up at a gun show somewhere where they don't realize that, that people are thinking they can get 150 bucks for it on eBay when it's originally like a $20 book. Uh, let's see, next up, Ian says... Sorry, this is actually one I should put on in-range, but I didn't think of it at the time. What was the final weight for the What Would Stoner Do rifle? Um, I don't actually have a final weight for the one that I did with an 18-inch barrel and a magnified optic. Um, I ended up coming to the conclusion, and I think this video will be out by the time this Q&A publishes. Um, I really kind of liked the short carbine version better. Um, it suited my needs better, so I ended up building a new upper in that configuration for myself. That one uh, comes in at 5 pounds, 3 ounces. That's with the Holosun red dot, uh, with a sling. I'm sorry, with a Holosun red dot, no sling, and unloaded. So as you start adding more stuff to it, the weight's going to go up. Light, sling, ammo, that sort of thing. But uh, just the rifle and optic in its fireable condition, 5 pounds, 3 ounces, which is just really fantastically light. Uh, it's hard to appreciate how light and handy that is until you actually put your hands on one. Uh, next question is Anthony says, what was the main hindrance in World War I with automatic firearms development? Materials, ideas, or cost? If it comes to shoulder rifles, I would say all three. Um, there were semi-automatic full power, very close to full power rifles that were developed. Uh, the classic example is the Browning uh, or the Remington Model 8 designed by John Browning. That was available well before World War I. It was pretty much a full power rifle. And it was functional, and it was reliable, and they were very popular guns. However, it was uh, long recoil action, and it was not really quite military spec. Uh, would not have done well on the battlefield, I suspect. And that's why it was never adopted uh, by any military. The problem was when, when military arsenals went to try and develop semi-automatic rifles, they ran into the metallurgy at, at that point, 19, in the 19 teens, was not as good certainly not for the cost, as um, uh, metallurgy we would have even a couple decades later. A good example of that are the uh, 1903 Springfield receivers that are considered unsafe today. They don't predate World War I by that much, and at that point, Springfield was still measuring temperature uh, in its heat treating process by visually eyeballing the color of the metal. And they discovered that depending on the lighting, whether it was a sunny day or a cloudy day, that could have a substantial difference on what the metal temperature looked like based on color, and that led to some serious heat treating problems. You still had issues like that in the lead up to World War I, and that, that can, that's, that's a problem for a bolt-action rifle. It's a bigger problem for a semi-automatic rifle where you have a lot more components where the heat treat is really important in that way. Gas piston systems and... Uh, rotating cams that are under a lot of uh, stress, that sort of thing. Um, ideas were also an issue. Uh, at this point, I would say the beginning of any sort of self-loading firearm design cannot start until 1886 with the, well, 1884, um, with the invention of smokeless gunpowder. Before With black powder, it's just never, it's not going to happen. There's too much fouling and it's not, not feasible. So if you think of... We think 1884 to 1914, we've got a couple decades of time for people to work on self-loading rifles. And there were, that was enough time to get some out in the commercial sphere. Uh, Winchester also had a self-loading rifle, although it was really more of an, yeah, a large pistol or an intermediate cartridge, not something like 8mm Mauser or 30 6 Being able to get a mechanism that can reliably and safely and accurately work in semi-automatic, and then keeping it below the required weight for a shoulder rifle, that was the problem. And it just simply took more time to get that figured out. It wouldn't really be until the 1930s that anyone had gotten a good answer to that question. Those answers, by the way, would be basically the M1 Garand and the uh, SVT-38, later to become the SVT-40. Uh, and then money, of course, was also an issue. So actually, let me back up a step. 
if you take the weight problem out of the equation, you'll see that there was a substantial amount of really good uh, repeating arms design during World War I. The two classic examples of that would be the Shosha, which is not the world's greatest firearm, but it is. It's safe, it's reliable, it's functional, um, and it was able to be produced in massive numbers at a relatively low cost because, well, it didn't have to be limited to the 10 or 11 pounds that you kind of want as a maximum for a shoulder rifle. The other is, of course, the Browning Automatic Rifle, the BAR. Uh, again, you, as long as you're willing to have a 16-pound gun, in the 19-teens that was possible to have a military-capable shoulder-fired uh, repeating rifle, or self-loading rifle. And anyway, lastly, uh, cost was definitely an issue. Uh, during World War I, you had economies, for the first time, really pushed into this concept of total war, and they did not have extra money to spend on frivolous things. And so most of the general staffs saw this as the standard bolt-action rifle does the job fine, and we can't justify spending two or three or four times the cost to try and come up with an experimental new self-loading rifle that, by the way, might or might not work, in addition to interrupting the manufacturing process, um, you can't just create an arms factory out of nothing in the middle of a war. And most, during World War I, pretty much everyone who was capable of manufacturing arms was doing so at full capacity with an existing bolt-action rifle or other larger type of firearm. So all of these issues, the materials, the design ideas, and the cost all came together uh, to pretty much ensure that there were no self-loading rifles, or very few of them, during World War I. Next up from KP, how come the new M-Lock or Keymod handguards still have a Picatinny rail at the 12 o'clock position for optics? How come M-Lock and Keymod aren't good enough for optics? And I would say the answer there is they're just not really repeatable enough. Um, you need to get a good, tight, uh, repeatable fit for an optic. Key mod just usually with key mod you're you're trying to clamp into something that's a relatively thin piece of sheet metal because that's how those how those uh, components work. That's why you have holes punched in them to attach things to. If you want an optic, the solution is to put on a piece of Picatinny rail and then put your device onto that. And so it makes sense that rather than bother with that, if you know that there is one particular surface that is going to be used for optics. It has to be as stable as possible. You don't want it bending, you don't want it twisting, um, you don't want it expanding or contracting if the thing gets hot, which isn't normally an issue, but in theory it could be. Then, yeah, just go straight to Picatinny rail. Um, John says, are there any action types with a blow forward piston? Yes, there are very few, but there are a couple. Uh, the early one would be the saint Etienne 1907 machine gun, which we actually have a video on. Um, I will link to that video at the very end of this one. You can take a look at it if you want. That has a rack and pinion system and a gas piston that actually blows forward towards the muzzle, which then pulls uh, an operating rod, which turns a gear, which opens the bolt uh, rearward. It is as complicated as it sounds, and that's exactly why nobody ever tried to follow up with the same sort of idea. Uh, the other one is not a machine gun, but rather a shoulder-fired rifle, and that is the uh, the Swiss AK-53 prototype, which never got beyond prototype status, but it was a gas-operated, forward-acting um, action. I have not yet had the chance to take one apart, however, I know that they do happen to have one at the National Firearms Center in Leeds, and the next time I am able to visit there, I will be taking a look at that very specifically. In fact, the next time I find one of those anywhere, it's definitely at the top of my priority list to get a video on for you guys, because they're just really weird, cool guns. Anything blow forward or gas piston forward, or should someone figure out how to do it, forward recoil operated is definitely on my list. Joe says, what is your opinion on the current Remington bankruptcy? How did they get to the point where they are now? I do not have, I'm not an expert on the recent machinations of Remington, but in general they got where they are now by not developing new products, by not really trying to grow, and by sacrificing quality control on their existing product line in exchange to basically suck money out of the company for the betterment of its officers and its shareholders. Uh, in order to keep any sort of company healthy, it has to reinvest a substantial amount of its earnings 
into the company itself. Uh, make sure that the people there are qualified and trained and happy and well paid so you don't have a lot of employee turnover. Make sure that um, you know you don't necessarily have to come out with some shiny fancy new product every year but you do need to keep abreast of the industry and make sure that you're producing the things that people want. You need to make sure that your products don't deteriorate in quality over time and that absolutely happened to Remington. Uh, if you look at some of Remington's you know they, they like they tried to reintroduce the Model 51 which was not a bad pistol. It's really a pretty slick little pistol with an overly complicated um, operating system. They tried to reintroduce that thing and it was a complete and abysmal failure. And it was a, pre it was a preventable failure. Um, my understanding is they released it before the engineering staff was comfortable with it and thought it was ready. Their, their solution was a disaster. Their replacement new guns apparently aren't all that good either. It comes as basically no surprise to me that Remington is going bankrupt. It's almost a surprise that it took this long. How do I feel about that? Honestly, the Remington of today only has one thing in common with the original Remington, you know, that was producing revolvers in the 1850s, and that is the name. Uh, it is a trademark that has been bought and sold. It's a brand name that's been bought and sold. The relationship between the original company and the current one is basically non-existent. So. I don't think that just slapping the brand name on the gun should make it particularly valuable in our eyes for any gun. I think it's more about the the background, um, how the thing was actually made, how well it's made, what the design is. That's the important part, not the brand name that's associated with it. So seeing the brand name go bankrupt, I, I have a hard time uh, getting, I have a hard time losing sleep over that. I would also point out that Remington has been bankrupt before. In the late 1800s, they basically went bankrupt and had to be bought out. So, not the first time. Let's see, where were we? Callum says, with the large scale adoption of 3D printing technologies, do you think it would be more likely that difficult design processes such as squeeze bore rifles might see a revival? Would a squeeze board design significantly alter the ballistics of a rifle caliber round enough to make it viable? So, uh, 3D printing technology has the potential to seriously change manufacturing because it allows you to, to, produce, to fabricate shapes that cannot be fabricated with traditional manufacturing techniques. With a cutter that has to remove material, any place you want that cutter to go, you have to have access to it. So for example, let's just say hypothetically, you wanted to manufacture a solid ping pong ball that had a couple of struts cross braced inside of it. Well, you cannot do that with a milling machine because if it's a solid ping pong ball, there's no way to get a cutting tool inside it. You could do that by casting perhaps, which generally doesn't have uh, the world's highest uh, precision. However, with uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing, you're going to build that thing from the bottom level all the way up to the top, and you can create any sort of internal features that you want. That's where 3D printing or additive manufacturing is really going to change uh, technology, and it'll be across all industries, not just firearms. I have a hard time trying to predict exactly what developments that might promote. Um, I don't think squeeze bore technology is going to be one of them. For people who aren't familiar with it, the idea there is you actually have a projectile with sort of wings or flanges on it, and uh, and it starts at a larger caliber than, the, the chamber is a larger diameter than the muzzle. So most commonly this was used for a couple of anti-tank guns. The Germans had one in World War II. I believe the German one, they had a couple. I think their most successful one started at 42 millimeters and tapered down to 28 millimeters by basically crushing the projectile down, what this did was dramatically increase chamber pressure and thus increased muzzle velocity. That's why they were using it in an anti-tank gun. They had a hardened core in the projectile and by getting it going really, really fast, they made it a more effective uh, penetrating cartridge, penetrating uh, projectile than it would have been otherwise at, at 28 millimeters. The downside to that, and the reason that it wasn't ever really done in large numbers is that are twofold. One is your chamber pressure goes up a lot, and that's a, definitely a potential issue in a shoulder rifle. The other is it had a took a tremendous toll on barrel life. 
the barrel life of those squeeze bore anti-tank guns was tiny. And the same thing would be true if you were taking, let's just say you were taking a 30 caliber bullet and trying to squeeze it down to 28 or 25 caliber. You're going to put a ton of wear on the barrel and you're going to have a really high chamber pressure. And you're going to get higher velocity out of it. So there are benefits. I suspect that those benefits are not going to be justifiable enough to anybody uh, to adopt that on anything beyond someone's fun idea of a wildcat experiment. That will probably happen. Any sort of military adoption or large-scale commercial adoption, I would be very surprised to see. Edward has two questions. First one is, what was the last U.S. horseback cavalry carbine? The answer may surprise you. The answer is the 1903 Springfield. Uh, the U.S. adopted, in fact, a new set of cavalry web gear and equipment in 1912, along with a new cavalry saber, and those were designed to go with the 1903 Springfield. Uh, as with the short rifles in service with other countries, the 1903, as a short rifle, kind of an intermediate length gun, replaced both cavalry carbines and infantry rifles. That was true here in the U.S. Uh, as as with everywhere else. Uh, before that, the cavalry carbine would have been the Craig Jorgensen carbine. Uh, Edward's second question is, um, I have seen pictures of the U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guardsmen in World War II with a vehicle-mounted potato digger. Uh, when was that weapon finally taken out of service? Well, I don't have the exact picture you're referring to, and I can certainly see it staying in service with the Coast Guard or National Guard units or other uh, not first tier military, you know, not frontline fighting services. Don't take any offense, Coast Guardsmen. That's came out a little wrong. Um, uh, in in terms of the, the the standard U.S. military, the potato diggers were out of service by the 1930s. Um, there was actually an experiment, a little bit of an experiment in the 1930s to turn them into a belt-fed light machine gun, you know, with a bipod and a pistol grip and something that could be carried around by one or two soldiers. That didn't go anywhere, and they ended up surplusing the guns out. Um, some of them did stay in inventory, and the ones that did, I believe, were all sent to Britain uh, at the beginning of World War II for British Home Guard use. I would also point out, um, this is not necessarily just the Colt 1895 gun, which is the, the, the colloquial potato digger because of its underswinging gas lever. Uh, we're also talking here about the Marlin uh, 1917 and 1914 guns, which were... Uh, modified to use a straight directional, a, a much more traditional gas piston. Um, and those things were developed and, and manufactured in much larger numbers than the Colt 1895s. They were used as aircraft and tank machine guns uh, late in World War II. So that those account for a lot of the, the Colt-style guns that were still in the inventory after World War I. Sorry, aircraft and tank machine guns in World War I, not World War II. Uh, moving on, Tim says, what was the first gun you bought solely because it added something of note to your collection uh, rather than buying it for a practical purpose? Uh, actually, the second gun I bought, which was a Colt uh, 1903 Pocket Hammerless. It was just a really cool gun. Uh, the first gun I bought was a 22 rifle, and, and that was an eminently practical gun. The second gun I bought was a Colt 1903 Pocket Hammerless, which could be practical. It was certainly... When it was introduced, it was a very popular um, concealed carry gun. When I bought it, not so much. Uh, so yeah, I've kind of been buying impractical guns from the very beginning of my uh, gun buying career. Next up, uh, Mitchell. Is the FAMAS the best bullpup ever, and when do we get to see an in-depth video on yours? That I, I want to be careful answering that question, because I want to make sure that if I say yes, and I think I might say yes, but if I say yes, I really want to make sure personally that it's because of the weapon's actual qualifications and not just because it's French and I like French guns and I have a collection of French guns. I think the it, if we want to look at this systematically, we would compare it to the other bullpup rifles out there. Um, the L85, yeah, it's obviously better than that. The L85 is a terrible gun. Um, in the A2 version where HK has fixed it up, it's a serviceable gun, but it's still too heavy and the FAMAS is definitely better than it. Um, Steyr AUG or AUG, I would contend that the FAMAS is a better gun than the AUG. Um, it doesn't have an optical sight like the AUG, but the AUG's optical sight isn't the greatest. Uh, it doesn't have a quick change barrel, but I don't think that really is all that relevant. 
The FAMAS does have excellent iron sights. It does have a free-floated bipod, which the AUG does not. It has a better trigger than the AUG, and I would argue that it handles better than the AUG. So I'd put it above the L85 and the AUG. Um, the other bullpups, so that's, that's most of the bullpups that were actually in service, uh, military service at that time. We could add to that uh, the Israeli Tavor. That one's going to be fairly arguable. Um, it's quite a lot newer than the FAMAS, and thus it has some advantages. Um, it has a pretty decent trigger to it. It doesn't have a bipod. Almost, In fact, I don't think any of the other uh, bullpups out there have a bipod, and I really think that is a definite advantage for the FAMAS, for any combat rifle, being able to have a very low profile and specifically a free-floated bipod. Um, a lot of the bipods you see on some of the older guns, things like FALs and uh, BM-59s, they're not free-floated. They are attached directly to the barrel. And when you shoot off of those bipods, you see a really substantial change in your point of impact. Those bipods aren't there to allow precision shooting. They're there to allow the gun to be used as a pseudo-light machine gun, where you're aiming as much by watching impact of the bullets as you are by using your sights. With the FAMAS bipod, it really is there to allow precise shooting, and that makes a difference. Um, so, arguably it's not better than the Tavor. I would also uh, take a look at the, the FN F2000, which is also a pretty darn good gun. It is more ambidextrous than the FAMAS. The FAMAS can be switched from one shoulder to the other, um, but it takes... it's an administrative task. You have to change around parts in the bolt. The, uh, the F2000, you can literally just swap shoulders anytime you want because it ejects forward. However, it has a much more complicated action than the FAMAS. There's a lot to be said, as we touched on earlier in this Q&A, those delayed blowback systems, which the FAMAS is, with a fixed barrel, they can be really accurate and really simple and really reliable. So I guess I can't necessarily make the claim that the FAMAS is the best bullpup ever. I think it absolutely had the potential to be if it had continued to receive modernization uh, attention in the way that other guns have over the past 30, almost 40 years now. But instead, Saint-Étienne shut down, the FAMAS will never be produced again, and so it doesn't get that sort of um, continuous upgrade and improvement. The, the French military has done some things to, to update it, mostly to kind of accommodate um, optical sights on it. I would love to get my hands on some of those versions, the Valorisé and the Suribassé models, the chances of ever finding something like that here in the U.S. are basically zero. Hopefully, maybe, someday uh, I will be able to get my hands on those in France or elsewhere in Europe. Uh, that has a, a potential to, to change the, you know, to put a finger on the scale in favor of the FAMAS. Uh, but ultimately, people will come out with better stuff, better bullpups than the FAMAS. If they haven't already, they will sooner or later. Oh, and when do we get to see an updated video or an in-depth video on mine? Hopefully, by the time, I think, by the time this Q&A airs, uh, we are uh, showing footage from the Desert Brutality 2018 uh, two-day, two-gun uh, extravaganza match that we had back in February. We're showing that footage over on InRange TV, and I used my FAMAS through all eight stages of that match. So uh, I talk a lot about how it did in a variety of situations. I'll be doing another Forgotten Weapons video on it out at the range, but if you want to see that thing, the FAMAS actually in action in a competition environment, head over to InRange TV. And if we're not if we're not posting those videos when you see this, we will be very shortly. All right, uh, Mike says, "What nation do you feel is often underappreciated or overlooked in small arms development or history?" And not to be too cliche, but I'm going to say France again. And in fact, we don't even really necessarily know the extent to which French efforts are underappreciated in arms development, because a lot of what they did is still a state secret. What you had in most places in the world was small arms development being done by private companies uh, or private sort of inventors working with government-owned uh, arsenals, but they were inventors who were able to actually take credit for their work. And so we have a patent record of what all of these different people and companies were doing. You'll see that, for example, with Mauser. They're a private company. Every one of those Mauser prototype semi-auto rifles uh, has patent, informa patent documents behind it. And you can look it up and you can see what people did and what they were trying and what worked and what didn't. In France, 
the military small arms development program was considered a state secret and none of its work or almost none of its work was ever patented so the only way to to actually find out what the french were doing and in many cases how far ahead of a lot of other countries they were in experimentation is to dig into records that are often still considered state secrets in france because no one's dug into those records in 75 years or had reason to try and get them unclassified. There is a reference book that talks about this, and it is uh, Proud Promise by Jean Yuan. And if you're interested in early, se early semi-automatic arms development, this is definitely a book worth getting. Because it's about French rifles and they're underappreciated, uh, it's still a book that's available and pretty cheap. And it goes into as much detail as anything. Basically, everything we do know is in here. Um, and you'll see the French working on all manner of uh, operating mechanisms, uh, you know, tilting bolt, rotating bolt, uh, direct gas impingement systems, flapper locking systems, recoil operated, long recoil and short recoil, uh, the whole array of firearms operating methods uh, the French were experimenting with. So... This is a good resource, but there's still a ton of information on this subject that just isn't uh, in the public domain yet. All right, second page. Uh, Chance says, in recent years, there has been another spike of stocked, or in this case, braced pistols, like Glocks and some of the SIG offerings. Do you think that these modern variations offer anything more... Uh, anything over the more traditional takes like high powers and lugers, such as functionality, extending the standoff distance, etc., like the micro Roni, for example. Um, there are two different things being discussed here. So stocked pistols are one thing, and we absolutely are seeing uh, more of those showing up. The, um, the Bruger and Tomet universal service weapon is a really interesting example of that, which I would love to get my hands on, but have not yet. Uh, the braced pistols are not, they're, they're a different thing than the classic pistol with a shoulder stock on it. Uh, the braced pistols are basically just a workaround to avoid the NFA restrictions on short barreled rifles. If you have an AR-15 pistol with a 10 inch barrel or a 12 inch barrel and a, a, an arm brace that makes it technically a pistol, uh, as we saw from the myriad of letters going to ATF and the decisions back and forth, the reason people are interested in those is because those braces can be used as shoulder stocks without requiring short barreled rifle registration. And what that gets you is a nice short carbine. That is, the idea with a stocked pistol was that it could be carried on the hip like a pistol uh, with a very low impact. It was something for officers or potentially policemen or vehicle crews, someone where you didn't have the ability or it'd be very impractical to carry a full length, even a short carbine around over the shoulder all the time. And so instead you had a way to carry a pistol, but give it this option to extend its range a little bit. Uh, that's totally different than our short barreled rifle workaround in the form of an arm brace. Now, when it comes to stocked pistols, I'm a little bit torn because I really like the idea. I think they're really cool, but if you really press me on it, I kind of have a hard time justifying, you know, coming up with a practical purpose for them. Uh, perhaps, a, you know, a ye old cop on the beat, or even, I suppose, cop on the beat today, if someone's walking on foot, yeah, being able to carry just a holstered sidearm makes sense, but someone, you know, a, a police officer in that situation could find themselves in a place where they want to be able to make a longer ranged or a more precise shot, and maybe they do have enough time to assemble a stock onto the gun. I can see that being an option, but it's kind of a specialized thing. Short barreled carbines are just very handy carbines in general, and they have, I think, a much wider application um, for military and security purposes in general. And by the way, the modern ones, the advantage that they have that they're able to offer is twofold. First off, they're based on modern guns that have modern magazine capacities. If you, I, I've looked at trying to take um, stocked pistols that are exempt from NFA because of their age, things like uh, the Canadian production high powers, Luger, you know, original artillery Lugers, that sort of thing. Uh, if you try and get one of those for a practical competition, you'll very quickly find that 
pretty much the only one that can hold more than seven or eight rounds is the high power. Everything else is a single stack magazine. They're often expensive magazines. Uh, if you do this, if you have a modern take on this, like BNT's Universal Service Weapon, now you're looking at 15 to 20 round standard magazines, which make them a lot more practical, um, a lot more effective. You also have the, the mechanical factor of the stock. And on a lot of the new guns, at least as far as I've seen them, the stocks are actually stable and solid. On pretty much all of the old, you know, the antique style of stocked pistols that I've handled, the stocks wobble around a lot. The high powers do, the Lugers do, Lotties do, Steyr Hans do, virtually everything. The grip's pretty awkward and it's inevitably loose. It may not have been loose, you know, brand new from the factory, but by the time you put any volume of ammunition through it, those stocks loosen up and wobble and that makes them kind of annoying to use. All right, uh, Tim says, how often do museums and private collectors approach you to do videos on their guns versus you approaching them? Well, it's uh, pretty much a binary thing. Pretty much all the time, I approach museums and private collectors approach me. And that's largely because I know where the museums are. And so I'm able to kind of hunt them down and go, ah, I'm going to be able to be in that area. And, you know, I've seen people talking about this museum and I know they have some really cool stuff. So let me contact them and see if I can schedule a time where I can get in and do some filming. And when it comes to private collectors, often, in fact, the private collectors I've worked with have all been people, continue to be people that I didn't know before they reached out to me. So they are often people who have a lot of expertise in their particular field. And I'm rather humbled to say they see what I'm doing and they're like, that person appreciates what I have. I would like to share it with, with Ian and then, you know, uh, by extension with you guys in the audience. And so they'll invite me to come visit or meet up somewhere or occasionally borrow a gun. And I've developed some really excellent relationships that way. Uh, once I know a person, once we've worked together, and presumably, hopefully, they uh, don't mind the experience or enjoy it or learn something about their own guns themselves. That's, that's always my goal when I'm filming with a private collector is that between the two of us, we can discover something about their collection that they didn't know before. So hopefully there's something in it for them as well. Uh, anyway, once I have those relationships established, I'm able to return to those people uh, again later on and film more of their cool guns. Uh, next one, Evil Cheese <laughs> says, what would you consider to be the segue, overly hyped and politically hampered, modern firearm? And my answer to that would be the Chris Vector. Uh, this thing got a lot of attention. It still is all over the place as far as I can tell in video games. It shows up a lot in Hollywood media, movies and television. And yet, it is a gun whose entire raison d'etre is full auto recoil reduction, and it's a gun that you cannot make. There are no transferable vectors because they're all brand new. You can only get one as a police or military agency or a machine gun manufacturer dealer. So on the vast, you know, the market for them here in the United States is only the semi-auto limited version, and that gun is completely pointless in semi-auto. Uh, we actually have a video up on InRange it was only fairly recently, it was only at this most recent SHOT Show that I had a chance to actually shoot one. And I shot a couple of them, uh, a 9 and a 45, uh, put a couple mags through each, and actually got a feel for how they handle in their burst mode and their full auto mode. And I think there is something to those guns, basically with the two round burst. Um, but when you put it in unlimited full auto, it just dumps mags too fast. Um, it's, I think the rate of fire is too fast in fully automatic mode. I don't think that recoil reduction really works as well as, as Chris would like us to think it does. And again, in semi-auto, it's a completely pointless gun. Um, get yourself any other carbine because it's going to be lighter, it's going to be handier, it's not gonna have all the extra bulk and, and weird operating principles necessary to do this recoil reduction, move the bolt down instead of back sort of deal. Next, time, next one, uh, Doyle says, how did Commonwealth militaries go about designating weapons for drill purpose? Would a weapon, say an SMLE, with DP, which stands for drill purpose, stampings, uh, be safe to operate, or would a gunsmith's inspection be in order before trying? 
Um, I think I should very clearly say, if the gun is marked DP, you know, as a, an Enfield or other British military firearm, it is not safe to shoot, and you should absolutely treat it as such. I, I actually have some first-hand information from a British military armorer, um, a really skilled, long-serving armorer who did some of, you know, he created DP guns himself. He is intimately familiar with the process, and not every part on every DP gun is bad. However, there are absolutely no no gauging tolerances or requirements for DP guns. Uh, they are always going to be the worst possible guns that are available to an armorer when those guns become needed. And the British would keep stuff around that was not safe to use. Um, this guy in particular mentioned uh, two situations he was aware of. One was a batch of rifles that had been in a big fire, which, if you don't know this, if a gun's in a fire, there's a really good chance that uh, its heat treat has been substantially altered by prolonged exposure to high temperature. Uh, and that can, that can turn a great, fantastic, safe receiver into a time bomb that will shatter like glass the first time you fire it. Uh, guns that have been in fires are explicitly not safe to fire. Well, in this particular case, a bunch of guns had been in a fire. Um, the metal was salvaged. You know, stocks were damaged. They replaced the stocks. And they actually refinished the guns. They, you know, they, they made them look like new guns. Just because, why would you hand out, you know, ashen-covered, sooty guns for training? No, they handed them out like they were nicely refurbished guns. Clearly and heavily stamped DP. But had someone actually tried to fire one of those things, the results would have been extremely bad. Um, another example he brought up was um, a batch of guns that had actually been on a ship that sank and they were underwater for an extended period of time. They were eventually salvaged along with other stuff. And the, again, these are guns that are not suitable to actually fire because of corrosion, um, especially corrosion underneath the wood, in, you know, in crevices where you wouldn't normally look, where there would normally be no reason to expect corrosion. Well, if it's been immersed in salt water, all bets are off. Uh, and again, these things were put together like new guns for training purposes, for training use. And the training uses are, some of them are very mundane, they don't involve firing. Uh, some of them involve things like giving to paratroops. So, okay, you're going to practice jumping out of an airplane. It's important to have a rifle with you so that you understand what it's like to both get out the door and then land safely with a rifle. However, we don't want to give you brand new rifles because the chances are a lot of you guys are going to break the things one way or another. So, training DP rifles. Um, anyway, come back around to the beginning. If it's marked DP, it's not necessarily a time bomb, but it's definitely a rifle that is explicitly below the standards required for any sort of live fire by the British military. And you should not be willing to shoot a gun that fails to meet those standards. Get a gunsmith to inspect it if you like, but I would not trust uh, just a gunsmith's inspection. You can inspect a rifle all you want, but if that action was in a fire, and then it was reconditioned to look like new, you're not going to be able to tell that. So, just don't shoot DP guns. Uh, Josh says, as someone who one day wants to own an automatic weapon, what's the process you have to go through to be able to purchase one? What license, tax, etc. do you have to pay, and is there an agency other than the ATF you have to go through? I would say, first off, um, after you watch this video, do some Google searching. You'll find some really good extended how-to guides for this sort of thing. In general, uh, the process is you find a transferable machine gun that you want to buy, um, that, you know, find someone selling it, agree to the price, pay them, and then what you have to do is fill out uh, a, a form with ATF. And it's basically a two-page form, front and back, uh, but you'll need three copies of it. You fill out name, address, um, and then some information on the firearm, uh, the make, the model, the serial number, the caliber, that sort of stuff. You will uh, attach to it a, a photograph of yourself and also a set of fingerprints. That gets sent to ATF. Uh, ATF, by the way, is the only agency you deal with for this process. ATF will take your form and they will run you through a pretty darn uh, extensive uh, FBI background check to make sure that you are not prohibited from owning firearms. There is no special requirement for owning a machine gun beyond owning any standard firearm. So if you can own a rifle legally, you can own a machine gun legally. 
but they are going to do a more thorough and comprehensive background check to make sure of that fact before they give it back to you. Um, the legal basis for that paperwork is that you actually have to pay a tax in order to transfer possession of a machine gun. It's a $200 tax. When that was introduced in 1934, of course, it was a completely, that, that was a huge tax. Um, it basically, it was such a large dollar value that it prevented anybody from effectively owning machine guns. Uh, and that's what, it was meant to be a prohibitive tax. However, it was not indexed to inflation at all. So because the supply of machine guns has been cut off and the tax has remained at the same numerical value, we now have $20,000 machine guns that have $200 taxes on them, where the relative value in the 30s would have been the exact opposite. It would have been like $2 machine guns that had $200 taxes on them. So uh, you send in your $200. You can actually do that by credit card now. You can put your credit card number and expiration date and all uh, on the form and send it in, or you can send them a check or a money order. You will then, the, the most significant part of this is you will then have to wait for them to process this paperwork because this is done on machine guns, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, destructive devices, and suppressors, aka silencers. And there's a huge volume of these things being uh, traded back and forth uh, every year. There's a very limited number of ATF staffers who deal with this stuff. And waiting periods, there, there is no formal waiting period. The practical waiting period will vary between four and as much as 12 months. And so you send your stuff in, and once it comes back approved, presumably, uh, you are then able to legally take possession of the gun. So a couple other things that <clears throat> will impact you in this, uh, you cannot transfer a, a machine gun from, in fact, you can't transfer any firearm, from one state to another without going through a licensed dealer. So if the person, if you buy a machine gun from a person who lives in the same state as you, you go through this process I just described, when your tax stamp comes back approved, the two of you meet up and they give you the gun and you're done. If you're buying the gun from someone who lives in a different state, what you actually do is apply to transfer the gun from the first owner to a, a licensed machine gun dealer in your state and that, because that person is a licensed dealer, that transfer will typically go very quickly. A couple of weeks tops, could be just a couple of days, depending on the circumstances. Then your dealer, uh, th then you put in the paperwork to transfer, the same paperwork, to transfer it from the dealer in your state to you personally. And that's what takes the long period of time, is doing the background check on you, the private individual. So um, finan the, the typical financial arrangements for something like that vary. Um, some people will insist on full payment up front. I certainly understand that from the gun owner's perspective. Uh, sometimes uh, you and the seller will agree to a 50-50 payment where you pay them half and then you put in the paperwork and when the transfer is approved then you pay them the other half and take possession. That's probably most, you know, a lot of this depends on how much do you trust the seller? Is it a person you know? Uh, if you buy a machine gun through an auction house like Rock Island or James Julia uh, or Morphe's, they will uh, they'll insist on payment up front, but at least in my mind that's not such a concern because they're a recognized company. They're not going to disappear overnight like in theory a private seller might. So I think that pretty much covers... Uh, the one thing you have to be aware of after you own a machine gun is that if you want to take it across state lines for any reason, you actually have to, um, you have to tell ATF and get their permission to do so in advance. And there's a separate form that you have to fill out to do that. So that's, there are some loopholes in that. Um, if you're a dealer, you don't have to do that. And so if you are a Curio and Relic licensee and you have a Curio and Relic machine gun, well, as far as CNR guns go, you are a dealer and thus you I shouldn't say this as legal advice without 100% checking it, but uh, you don't then need to get paperwork to take a machine gun, a CNR machine gun out of state with you if you are a CNR licensee. If you have a modern machine gun, yeah, and you want to cross state lines for any length of time, you have to tell ATF about it. So that I think pretty much covers that procedure. Next question is... Da, 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 da. Uh, Aiden says the Soviet Union made a prototype triple barrel assault rifle called the TKB-59. From what I've heard, it fired really fast with three barrels. Do you think this gun could have had some potential, or is it just a rifle that was made to function like a light machine gun? 
I am going to, I, I'm familiar with the gun, although I've never actually handled one. I would love to get my hands on one at some point. The US did also experiment with multi-barreled infantry rifles. The purpose there, and I'm assuming it was the same purpose for the Soviets, was to try and have a system where one trigger pull resulted in multiple simultaneous or effectively simultaneous impacts on target as a way to improve the, uh, the, the accuracy of the individual soldier. So we saw multi-barrel guns in that project. Uh, at the same time, countries also experimented with uh, single cartridges that had multiple projectiles. So there, was, there were versions of 30-06 that had two or even three independent bullets. So you'd fire once and you'd get three bullets out the end, which in theory means you have three chances to hit instead of one. So if your aim is slightly off to one side, well, you've got a spread of projectiles and maybe you'll still get hit anyway. And we also saw a very, very high rate of fire guns. The idea being if you pull the trigger and you get a two or a three round burst, all while the gun is just initially recoiling towards you before the muzzle starts to climb, then again, you have a better chance of, of making a hit without having quite the perfect aim. Uh, as far as multi-barreled guns go to that end, I don't think any of them had potential. The problem is having three barrels adds so much extra weight to the gun, having three bolts and three magazines in order to feed three barrels, this is not a practical way to, to achieve this, this end. I can see why uh, people experimented with it, and they do make good control, uh, you know, control guns for experiments. If you want to see how practical is it to fire three bullets out of one projectile, well, being able to compare it to three simultaneously fired bullets out of separate barrels, there's some value in that. Um, and they certainly look cool, but as a practical gun, no. I think the, the weight and the complexity requirements mean that those will never achieve any, any practical status. And to this day, they never have. Um, you'll see rotary barreled guns, but that's a different thing because those are only firing one barrel at a time uh, and they avoid a lot of the issues of you know double or triple barreled infantry rifles. Mark says, do you think the designs of early semi-automatic rifles would have been affected if the designers had modern high-speed cameras? Yes, absolutely. I think we would have seen significantly faster progression of semi-automatic and automatic rifle design. There were some early ways to be able to sort of duplicate the effect of a high-speed camera uh, in the early days. They would do things like uh, if you had a component on the gun, you could cut a little drill, a pinhole in it and then have a light projecting through the gun onto a sheet of paper, and you could use, uh, you could magnify the, well, if you then rolled paper through behind the gun and tracked where the pinpoint of light was, you could actually track where it was moving um, as you fired a gun by having a very, by having a continuous camera there. I need to do a full video on how some of these mechanisms worked, but suffice to say there were some simplistic ways to get limited data equivalent sort of to a high-speed camera. But if these guys had been able to look at high-speed footage, like the sort of stuff I can take on a camera about this big today, yeah, they would have, it would have allowed them to speed up development by a huge amount. Being able to see exactly what's going on in the gun and not have to experiment with different solutions. You know, if you're fire, if you have a very fast cycling action, something like a Luger, and it has a malfunction, yeah, if you can just slow it down so that you can watch it in high speed and see exactly what's causing the problem, that'd be a huge advantage. Uh, Chris says, uh, why do you think that primer actuated semi-autos like John Guerin's early rifle prototypes never really went anywhere? The two biggest reasons I've seen cited are inconsistency in the ammunition and incompatibility of the ammunition with existing guns. The first point seems like a relatively simple problem to overcome in mass production for the benefit of a smaller action. And if they were considering a switch to 276 Pedersen, then the point is a non-issue too. The second point is a non-issue too. Or is it simply that MacArthur effectively mandated OT6 and no one ever picked up the technology again? Uh, no, there are, there are very definite systemic problems with a primer actuated system. The issue is, in order for it to, well, let me back up a step. Uh, for people who aren't aware of the early Garand prototypes, primer actuated means that the primer of the cartridge actually acts like a little teeny gas tappet. And when you fire, the primer backs out of the case, and there's a little piston head in the bolt face that moves backward, and that causes the bolt to unlock and cycle. 
It's a really clever system. The problem is it requires ammunition in which the primer is able to move backwards. And if you take that ammunition and you put it into any other system, you risk primers backing out when you don't want them to. In fact, if you look at military ammunition, usually the primers are staked into the cartridges so that they won't back out under any uh, circumstance. When you get, for example, machine guns, belt-fed machine guns, uh, you have a lot of recoil impulse acting on the belts and the ammunition, and you don't want... All it takes is a primer moving a little bit backwards, and you can, you can either cause a malfunction in the gun because the cartridge doesn't feed properly, or you can cause a really serious safety issue if the primer is, is backed out, when, it, when the bolt hits the back of the cartridge to push it into the chamber, you have the potential of the bolt actually setting off the primer right there, the cartridge exploding out of battery and causing significant damage to the gun and maybe even the user as well. So if primer actuated systems were to be adopted, you really would have to, you'd really have to have all the weapons in the inventory using that ammunition be designed for primer actuated ammo, which they were not uh, in the, you know, in between the world wars in the U.S. And you're always, you, you've got a very, very sh uh, small margin of error for the amount of friction in that primer because too much and it won't cycle the, the primer actuated guns, too little and under vibration or recoil primers might back out. That's, that's a tough problem to solve, and ultimately the rewards on, in the firearm action weren't worth it. It was better to stick with a tried and true and more reliable and easier to produce type of standard ammunition and come up with a different firearm action to use it. Cameron says, have you had any luck finding or hand loading some 32 French long ammunition? Yes, yes and no. So. Um, my Moss 38 submachine gun, it turns out, what I hadn't realized is apparently the gun was actually deactivated at some point and had been legally reactivated and the barrel had been plugged and whenever, whoever reactivated it, when they bored out the chamber, they actually cut it too deep. And that's what was causing problems for me. The cartridges were going too deep into the action and thus, and then not firing, uh, or I'm sorry, too deep into the chamber. So I have acquired a replacement barrel. I haven't yet gotten to the point of finding a gunsmith to replace the barrel for me. That's coming. Um, I have gotten ammunition for the gun from a couple of sources. I have some Buffalo Arms ammo. I also have some Reed's custom ammo. And while I haven't been able to test either of them in the submachine gun, because I don't have the new barrel in it yet, I have tried them both in 1935A and 1935S pistols. And unfortunately, in you know, this is a, a sample size of only two pistols, but neither of those brands of ammunition were able to reliably cycle either of my pistols. So I am still on the hunt for proper 7.65 French long or 32 French long. Uh, there are reloading dies out there. People can make ammunition, can make cartridges and make ammo. However, I talked to Starline at SHOT Show this past year, and they told me that at some point within the coming year, they're going to be manufacturing at least one run of original proper spec uh, brass for a 7.65 French cartridge. So I am holding off for that. Um, I want to have enough ammo to really be able to use it in a submachine gun, which means that converting 32 Smith & Wesson cases just isn't a practical thing. Um, it's too expensive, takes too long. And I want to be able to load that cartridge to its proper pressure level, which is relatively hot, which is I think why the, the Reed and Buffalo Arms ammunition aren't cycling properly. I think for liability reasons, they're downloading that ammunition a little bit, and at least my two pistols won't tolerate that without having reliability problems. So 32 French long ammo is coming for sure. And if you have one of those pistols, I would say definitely uh, get a set of the reloading dies because even if we can't find someone to make uh, ready to go ammunition from Starline Brass, you will be able to buy Starline's Brass and then reload it yourself. And one last question here from Dan it says, regarding U.S. military conventions for naming equipment, how did we go from the M1911 straight to the M9? What were the M1 through M8 pistols? Similarly, the M2 through M13 rifles. That is a very good question. Um, and the answer is a lot of the, the guns that make up those, those missing numbers are generally uh, either guns that were adopted for a very short time and never really saw service before being replaced, or guns that you aren't thinking of. So 
I did some looking. I was not able, I, I'll be honest, I didn't spend a ton of time trying to find it. I wasn't able to find uh, the pistol designations, what we had in there. I suspect a lot of those are flare pistols. As for rifles, um, I do have a couple of the intermediary ones. Uh, for example, the M2 rifle was a subcaliber adapter for a larger artillery piece. So for training, you bolt a 30 or a 50 caliber rifle onto a 75 millimeter howitzer, and so you can have the guys go through the process of aiming and firing at a short range target, and it costs a 30 or a 50 caliber cartridge instead of a gigantic 75 millimeter artillery shell. Uh, the let's see, the M8 rifle was also a was a spotting rifle, um, 50 caliber I believe, and that was for the M40 recoilless rifle. Uh, that one actually was for checking aim. So you'd have a spotting rifle on top of the recoilless rifle, with a basically an observation type of projectile that followed the same ballistic path as the recoilless rifle projectile. So the M8 50 caliber ammunition is not the same as the standard uh, 50 caliber Browning machine gun ammunition, but it was used to simulate the arc, uh, the flight arc of that recoilless rifle round and help crews aim. That was the M8 rifle, just this little adapter mechanism that fired a 50 caliber spotter cartridge. Uh, the M4 and the M6 were both uh, aircraft survival rifles. The M4 was in 22 Hornet, the M6 was a 22 rimfire and 410 shotgun rifle, or shotgun uh, combination gun. And I, I didn't find any of the, I didn't spend the time to try and dig up any of the others, but you'll find that they're all in that sort of realm. Um, the M15, for example, was basically the, the squad automatic version of the M14. Uh, it was adopted and then it was very quickly pulled out of service because it really wasn't all that practical. So. Generally speaking, all of those intermediary guns are in there. Um, the carbine's the easy one. The M1 carbine was, we all know that, the M2 was the full auto, the M3 was the version with the night sight, and then the M4 carbine is what's still in use today. So that is 25 questions here for you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed them. Hopefully you learned something today that you didn't know before. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if you would like to get one of your questions into a Q&A video, check out the link below. Uh, to help support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. I am very much in debt to everyone there. And uh, that's all I got. Tune in tomorrow for more cool Forgotten Weapons content.